Excellent. Awesome. Well, you guys, we are live on Facebook and we are recording this uh, today. So as usual, if you would not like to have your image on YouTube at some point in the future, go ahead and click your video off. Um, but with that being said, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, well, actually, first of all, let me welcome you to the Little Lunch Lecture today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Borat. I'm the Director of Donor Relations at the Coastal Land Trust, for those of you I have not met yet. Um, okay, so I put a couple of links in the chat box. If you would like to get on our email list, if you found out about this on social but you don't get our emails, sign up, sign up there. Um, just check everything out there in the chat. Um, we'll keep everybody on mute during the talk, but later we'll let you unmute and ask questions if you'd like. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker now. Um, her name is Sarah Crate. She's the Outreach Co Communications Coordinator for the Longleaf Alliance. That is an organization that works to ensure a sustainable future for longleaf pine ecosystems. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. We're looking forward to learning what longleaf pine restoration looks like in North Carolina. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thanks for inviting me today. Um, I do have to start off with the caveat that fitting everything that I would love to talk about related to longleaf pine into a little lecture is kind of impossible. Um, so I had to leave out some things today. Um, so with that, if there are any um, questions that you have specifically about longleaf pine, please use the chat feature and speak up at the end when we're having our question and answers because I love to talk about longleaf. Um, and that's why I'm here. It's one of my favorite things to do, absolutely. Um, and I know that I, just looking at some of the people that have joined us today, we have some other longleaf experts and enthusiasts uh, joining the call, and so they'll be able to fill in with any of those answers that I might not know the answer to. We have, we have a lot of uh, knowledge on, the, on today's Zoom chat. Um, so um, I just wanted to demonstrate an, a photograph a little bit about how much I love to talk about longleaf. And that is uh, with this slide here. What you see here is a picture of my parents who came to visit me in North Carolina, thinking they were here to see our grandsons. Uh, what they actually got was a hike through Longleaf at one of our favorite, our family's favorite spots, Weymouth Woods Nature Preserve. Um, they humored me and my husband as we uh, visited this particular site to see a recent prescribed burn there. Um, they heard all sorts of information about longleaf pine life history and the fire ecology of the systems. And we had our uh, tree hugger photo with the oldest known living longleaf pine, 472 years young, found right here in North Carolina at Weymouth Woods. Uh, today, however, I can't get into everything that I just shared with them that day as we're hiking through the woods. So I wanted to focus specifically on what restoration efforts for longleaf pine looks like. Um, and I have this photo here. Um, this is uh, often what you see for restoration. This is a young planted longleaf pine stand. This one is specifically in Blading County. Um, and uh, the green is very vivid, that's why I love this photo. Um, you can even, if you look closely, you can see that kind of brighter green hiding in uh, along with the understory plants. Those are the grass stage long leaves. Um, and then the other ones are starting to put on their height, they're bolting to the sky. Some of them even have their lateral arms going. Um, and it is a sight to see. Um, I love that stage of longleaf because you get to run your hands through their long needles. Of course, that's where they get their common name, longleaf pine. Uh, they have the uh, longest needles of all the pine species here in North Carolina. Um, I have to just pause this for a second because my slideshow is on a timer that I am not keeping up with. So hold on just a minute. Technology issues once again. Um, so let me just do this. Um, so uh, eventually the trees uh, gain in size and we get this majestic, iconic looking longleaf shown here in this picture. 
it's very obvious that this is um, a high quality uh, timber product. You can see that straight form, consistent taper that Longleaf is known for. Uh, the Pinus palestris, its scientific name, commonly known as longleaf, was native, uh, is native to the southeastern part of the United States. It occurs in nine of our states um, and once covered an estimated 90 million acres. Um, now, that longleaf pine uh, distribution across the southeast is closely file, follows the frequency of fire that historically occurred in this region. Uh, this image, you can see those lighter gray areas are the areas that regularly saw fire from one to every three years to four to six years. And that's an important part of why longleaf was the dominant pine in this part of the world. Um, longleaf pine is uniquely situated to thrive in these fire landscapes um, from its those long dense needles to that grass stage life cycle that I just hinted at earlier. Um, I don't have time to go into all those really cool um, pieces of longleaf and how and fire and how they go hand in hand, but I did want to share two of my very favorite resources. Um, that's the Pine That Fire Built brochure um, found on the Longleaf Alliance website. And then also this infographic that tries to show you how longleaf at different stages um, has different adaptations to fire. Um, and you can find that on the nclongleaf.org website. And I'll mention that website again later. Now, ecosystem, uh, it's not just the longleaf that's adapted to fire, it's also the entire ecosystem, the plants and animals that also are found along with longleaf. And that, that's really the key word here. You know, we, we're focusing on the tree longleaf, but longleaf restoration and conservation is not just about the tree, it's about the rich diversity of habitats and the species that call longleaf um, home. Uh, uh, now, I can't take you all out in the field uh, for a hike like I did that day with my parents, um, but I do have this video courtesy of Brady Beck, um, it's a Longleaf Serenity video series. Um, and so right now you see the butterfly, hopefully, flying across the video. Um, it's a great way for us to celebrate National Pollinator Week, which is right happening right now. Um, and that's, that's truly what longleaf restoration is about. It's about conserving, restoring this whole system. If you want to see more of Brady's longleaf serenity videos, uh, uh, just Google it. You'll find them on YouTube. Um, if, if we did get a chance to walk in the woods, we would get to see some of the plants and animals that call longleaf home. If we were really lucky, we might get to see some of the rare and endemic species um, that are shown here um, in these photos. Um, you all might be familiar with one of my favorites, the Venus flytrap. I call it the Carolina original as it's found only in a small part of North and South Carolina. And it's really the, um, the longleaf habitat and the loss of the longleaf habitat for this species that contribute to the urgency of its restoration and conservation. Um, so I mentioned earlier uh, that we at one time had 90 million acres of longleaf pine. This graph illustrates the deep decline in longleaf acres uh, in the 19th and 20th century, from just 90 million acres to a few million. Um, now, this, these numbers are abstract and large, and when you hear millions, you um, still might think, you know, well, so we still have millions. What, why is this an issue? Um, so to help grasp that hard concept, I, I have a new, um, a thing I would like to you guys to try out with me. And um, so I want everyone to imagine that everyone in the lecture today is a plant or an animal species that calls longleaf home. It's lunchtime, we're hungry, so I have brought along a snack, my pie, my chocolate pecan pie. I'm not a food photographer, so the image doesn't do it justice, but I promise you that this is a delicious pie. And everyone who's on the call today wants a piece of that pie. If we think about this pie representing the 90 million acres of longleaf that we once had in the Southeast, we have to share this. Unfortunately, other people got to our pie first, meaning we started losing our habitat. 
And over time, we lost more and more of that habitat due to conversion to non-forest uses, replacements uh, to other tree species like loblolly pine, and exclusion of fire from the landscape. Without enough pie to go around, the loss of longleaf resulted in the decline of us, the plants and animals that we're representing right now as we snack on this pie. By 1970, we had less than 6 million acres. By 1990, we're talking about crumbs, uh, only 3 million acres. And it's that habitat loss. Um, there's no way for us to share this pie amongst everyone on the, on the uh, lecture today. This is why so many species in longleaf um, and the habitat itself is considered at risk. It was from this sense of urgency that the Longleaf Alliance was founded in 1995. The need to reverse the decline was evident, and with that came a growing demand for information on how to restore longleaf pine forests. And that is the mission of the Longleaf Alliance, as Stephanie uh, mentioned earlier. It's to ensure the sustainable future for longleaf pine ecosystems. We do that by providing assistance to land owners and land managers who are working to restore and conserve longleaf. Specifically, we do this through science-based education and outreach, and those efforts are only made possible through our partnerships across the range of longleaf. One of these key range-wide partnerships is the America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative. It's celebrating its 10th year. The initiative is made up of public land management partners, federal and state uh, agencies, private landowners, nonprofits like the Longleaf Alliance, forest industry, um, longleaf enthusiasts, all coming together to try to reach a common goal of restoring 8 million acres of longleaf pine to the southeastern landscape. Thanks to the long-standing collaborations in longleaf restoration, the southeast now has approximately 4.7 million acres of longleaf pine habitat. That's up from the, the its peak low at 3 million acres in the 1990s. Um, and if we look at the last 10 years alone, the annual longleaf report has documented close to 14 million acres of accomplishments. That's planting acres, prescribed fire acres, and acres preserved or conserved through land protection. The accomplishments for longleaf happen across the range, um, but they are focused in uh, significant key landscapes where longleaf local implementation teams help to coordinate the work on the ground. Uh, here in North Carolina, we have three of them. If we look historically at longleaf in North Carolina, about half of our counties uh, had longleaf uh, uh, that, uh, where it occurred at, at about 90 million acres. Today, we have somewhere around uh, 400 to 450,000 acres of longleaf in North Carolina, and it is concentrated in those three key focal areas: the Sandhill Pines and or, or the Sandhills region in orange, the um, kind of maroon color representing the Cape Fear Arch, and the blue representing Onslow Bight. We're extremely lucky here in North Carolina that all of our longleaf restoration teams existed as conservation conservation partnerships prior to the establishment of America's Longleaf. The Sandhills Partnership, for example, is celebrating its 20th year this year, and the Cape Fear Arch and uh, Onslow Bite teams uh, have diverse conservation objectives with Longleaf just being one part. Um, we are also one of the few states to have a statewide team as well. That's the North Carolina Longleaf Coalition. Now, the benefit of the coalition is that it provides that statewide view of all things related to longleaf restoration and conservation. Um, some particular issues benefit more from that larger picture across the state. Um, and again, we are working in half the eastern half of our state. One of the most obvious examples of where that comes into play is through um, their online outreach through their website, nclongleaf.org. This creates a single porter, portal for landowners, longleaf enthusiasts, managers to find longleaf resources that are tailored to our state here in North Carolina. The coalition also provides the opportunity for partners to work together to 
provide outreach products. Um, one example that I'm going to show you today is the Longleaf on the Short videos. These are one minute videos that break down, you know, this big subject of Longleaf into these short segments. And the one I wanted to play today specifically focuses on how that um, Longleaf plays a part in our history and our cultural connections here in North Carolina. North Carolina's history is deeply rooted in Longleaf Pine. Our state's early economy was founded on longleaf forest products like turpentine, tar, and lumber. Today, these connections are reflected in our state tree, the pine, the Tar Hill nickname, the names of familiar places like the Tar River, and even North Carolina's official state toast, which begins, Here's to the land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun doth shine, where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great, Here's to down home, the old North State. I encourage you guys to try to find them. Uh, that series, again, just Google Longleaf on the Short um, and find the North Carolina Forest YouTube channel. Um, videos are great for reaching a wide audience, but workshops and trainings are key to assisting landowners and land managers in their longleaf restoration. This map shows um, just a snapshot of some of the outreach events that have uh, occurred specifically for Longleaf um, that, and sponsored by the North Carolina Longleaf Coalition. It's not a comprehensive list by any means. Um, many partners have conducted more events than depicted here, um, but it just gets a, a sense of, um, again, many of them are focused in those key focal areas and they have, um, there's been a lot. Um, they are collaborative efforts, and to, to illustrate that a little bit further, I added the Longleaf Alliance logo to the events where Longleaf Alliance staff were key to the organization or delivery of the content and presentations for some of those events. Um, if we were to count them up, we would see that over half of those had the assistance of the Longleaf Alliance in their delivery. Um, the, the type of outreach that we are providing to help facilitate longleaf restoration in our state and across the range comes in a variety of um, uh, uh, formats from workshops to trainings, but also community events, which is what some of the photos on the bottom of the slide depict. Uh, we have festivals and um, more interactive opportunities for the public, but then also those in-depth opportunities with Longleaf landowners to talk about the, the hows, twos, and the what ifs for longleaf restoration. With the Longleaf Alliance, one of the um, main ways that we deliver some of that contact content is through the Longleaf Academy program. Um, so these, these programs were designed to increase the knowledge level of um, managers regarding longleaf specific topics. Um, and by doing so, it creates this this great network of longleaf professionals across the range of longleaf and extends the reach of any single one entity, organization, or person. Uh, our courses address a variety of content. The uh, image shown here is one specifically looking at the understory, uh, learning about the plants that are so unique to our longleaf ecosystems and where the majority of the diversity of these ecosystems comes from. Um, but our, our academy program isn't the only opportunity that we uh, participate in, um, in North Carolina and elsewhere. I wanted to highlight just one of, uh, one particular workshop series that was very successful that the Longleaf Alliance participated in here in North Carolina. And this one was one that was designed to um, address a very specific topic in Longleaf restoration. It was, it was looking at how to shift different forest types more, more slowly or in a different way towards longleaf. Uh, a more traditional longleaf restoration looks like that picture I showed you at the beginning where you have an open stand that has been, um, once was longleaf, it's been converted to something else and we're putting it back to longleaf. Um, but sometimes we want to retain um, 
the canopy structure that's that's there right now as we slowly transfer that site to longleaf and that's what this picture is of uh, right here this is actually at the green swamp uh, managed and owned by the nature conservancy where that uh, those trees that you see in the background the overstory canopy is mostly slash pine which is not a native pine here to north carolina but what the Nature Conservancy has done is gone through an underplanted longleaf below that canopy of slash pine. And you can see um, some of those uh, longleaf starting to bolt up into the um, kind of the mid canopy. You can pick out their long tufted needles in that, uh, that sea of pine right there. Um, and this is just one example of how a, a specific topic can be identified as something an area might want to know more about and we can help um, the Long Live Alliance can help assist uh, with that information. Um, one of my favorite parts of that particular uh, workshop series was the fact that um, one of the field sites we visited um, actually ended up receiving this uh, recognition through the North Carolina Longleaf Honor Roll. And so what I, the pictures here are showing you a group of partners that have come together to, uh, to help celebrate that recognition for Edmar Farms. Um, the North Carolina Longleaf Honor Roll is a landowner recognition pro program offered by the North Carolina Longleaf Coalition. And it's basically a thank you for private landowners who are actively managing their longleaf, uh, specifically with prescribed fire. Uh, that recognition that day for Edmar Farms included state and federal agencies, private forestry consultant, um, and the Longleaf Alliance. Even uh, this particular project uh, included technical assistance from the Longleaf Alliance through the partnership and financial assistance of the North Carolina Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. And it's, I just wanted to kind of end on this note here with this picture to show the wide number of people um, represented in a, a single day to celebrate the good longleaf that has occurred at this particular property um, and how everybody brought a different piece to the table. And that's really how longleaf restoration does happen on the ground. So that is, that's what I, that brief snippet is what I wanted to share with you in terms of uh, what longleaf restoration looks like here in North Carolina and how the Longleaf Alliance is a part of that. Uh, if you would like to know more about the Longleaf Alliance, please visit our website um, and consider becoming a, a supporting member um, so that you can receive our quarterly magazine, The Longleaf Leader. The particular longleaf leader I show here on this screen is a picture from North Carolina showing a Party for the Pine Festival in Southern Pines, where our Burner Bob mascot is leading members of the prescribed, um, uh, the Sand Hills Prescribed Burn Association um, down to a demonstration fire. Again, another example of great partnership and action for longleaf restoration. I did also want to um, let everyone know who's listening to this lecture today that the Longleaf Alliance um, was slated to host the 2020 Biennial Longleaf Conference here in North Carolina in Wilmington in October. We have just made the big announcement that that particular event will be virtual this year, um, but we are very, very excited to announce that we will be in Wilmington for the 2022 conference um, and we'll be right here to celebrate Longleaf Restoration in North Carolina. So with that, I am open to questions if anybody has any. If anybody has a question, you can unmute your microphone and ask it. Hey, who's that guy? I just forgot that I wanted to put in one more plug to um, a North Carolina Longleaf Honor Roll recipient, David Allen, who um, anyone familiar with Janice Allen with the North Carolina Coastal Land Trust might know David. Um, they were, uh, David was one of the first recipients of the Longleaf Honor Roll uh, for his uh, devotion to prescribed fire in their Longleaf in Jones County. Awesome. <laughs> Neat. Um, I had a question actually. So I, I spent a little bit of time in, in growing up years in East 
Texas. And mm -hmm. noticed from your very first slide, like of the kind of the original range of longleaf pine ecosystem, that mm -hmm. it was pretty much contiguous all the way across the south, and then it kind of skipped a little bit and then ended up in East Texas. Um, so I'm, I'm curious a little bit if you know why that might be, and if you know if longleaf pine restoration is happening in East Texas as well. I'm just curious because I lived there for the, uh, a half a minute. <laughs> yes, longleaf pine restoration is definitely happening in East Texas. Um, Texas has a very active uh, team working for longleaf restoration in that part of the state. Um, the skip has to do, and I, I, I don't know the geography as well in that particular area, but the skip has to do with just appropriate habitat. Um, you know, the right soils, the right fre fire frequency, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you see these kind of disjunct populations sort of but it's um it's it is it is there and it is actively working on restoration there cool there's a question from bell that was in the chat um she would like to know how old the mid-level trees were in one of the photos that you showed maybe maybe the one from the green swamp um yeah so let me just pull that slide up um so, Belle, you were probably talking about this um, photo here. So, the um, overstory, I, I can't recall how, how old the, um, the largest pines are there, but if you're referring to these, these um, little guys that are coming out um, right here that are bolting up, if I recall, these particular trees are older. They're about 20 years old um, for this particular site. But the longleaf, um, when they start to bolt and go up, is very is it varies depend on the site and the conditions in which they're growing. Um, so you have some soil fertility uh, that plays into it, but then also light and competition. So in this particular site, there's they've retained that overstory canopy, so there's still quite a bit of shade, um, which might be a factor into why those trees are a little bit older before they um, jump out of the grass stage. Um, but they they can hang on in um, in some of these situations for quite a long time, working on their underground um, reserves and their extensive root system. Uh, we had a question about whether the public is able to participate in the virtual conference. So the virtual conference is open to anyone who's interested. There will be a registration fee um, for uh, conservation or conference participation. Um, and if you want to know more about the details of what that fee might look like and how to register, it'll all be available on the conference website, which is longleafconference.com. Um, right now, registration fees and um, are still being worked out since we just made the announcement that it will be virtual, but we welcome anyone who's interested in, in joining us to participate. Okay, um, there's another question about, um, the question is, does one always need to plant for longleaf restoration? So is there any other way to start that process? Yeah, so longleaf restoration um, looks different depending on uh, what you're starting with, right? Um, most of what we traditionally think about restoration is going to look more similar to that uh, initial restoration image I showed you with the, the planting in an area that has been um, converted to agriculture and is now going back into forestry or um, maybe it's a, was it an existing forest stand that was cut um, and is being planted back to longleaf. That is more typical of um, a lot of people's journey for longleaf, but it's not the only story. Um, there are landowners and land managers who have longleaf, existing longleaf, whether it's natural or was planted, you know, decades ago, who are working to um, restore that habitat where fire may have been excluded for a long period of time. Um, and so that is another big piece of longleaf restoration. Um, and, but in terms of getting, if you have a site where no longleaf is uh, present right now, that will require planting um, without a seed source um, of longleaf to generate on its own. It, it won't just show up um, without some help. 
Okay, we've got lots of great questions today. Connie Parker was uh, uh, curious if we should encourage planting in urban areas or to preserve longleaf in urban areas. One of the best ways for people to know about longleaf is to be surrounded by longleaf. Um, longleaf doesn't just have to be at a site that's far away that you drive to. You can um, definitely, I encourage people to uh, plant longleaf in those more urban um, settings so that that longleaf connection is, is there every day. Um, there are special considerations when you think about using longleaf in more ur urban settings, um, but it's something that many municipalities are doing um, and we would encourage. That's awesome. Ruth, any, any final questions before we wrap up today? Appreciate everybody's curiosity. Oh, there was one more question a little earlier in the chat. Um, would you be willing to share your recipe for the chocolate pecan pie? I absolutely would be. <laughs> yes. Oh, <good. laughs> uh, I don't think just, just make note of that name, Stephanie, and we would be happy to share it. Okay. <laughs> I will do it. Um, very good. Maybe I'll put it on the um, the coastallandtrust.org slash lectures page along with the recording of your um, video. I, maybe I could link to it there. Yeah, we can redub it longleaf chocolate pecan pie or something. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again, Sarah, for uh, presenting today. Um, it's really cool to hear about uh, bringing back longleaf from crumbs to possibly uh, a, a whole slice of the pie again. That, so thank you for the work that you and your organization are doing. I wanted to make sure that everybody knows about the next week, we will not be having a little lunch lecture, but we will be back uh, in July for all of the Fridays in July. Uh, kicking off in July will be Roger Shu from UNCW. We'll take us on a deep dive into Evanwood Preserve in Brunswick County. That is a partnership preserve between the Coastal Land Trust and UNCW, so join us for that. If you want to know more about the upcoming Little Lunch Lectures, you can visit our website and click on events, or you can go to coastallandtrust.org slash lectures. It's kind of listed in two different places there. Um, if you love the Little Lunch Lectures, consider becoming a member or renewing your membership with a donation. Um, we would love to have you. And, um, that is about it that we have for today, but thanks again for being here, everybody, um, Facebook and Zoom, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.